Kay Kirkpatrick is a lecturer in religion, philosophy, and culture at King's College London. An expert on Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, she has written several books on them both, including Sartre and Theology and the biography Becoming Beauvoir. Beauvoir herself was a philosopher, writer, and feminist icon whose work, as well as her personal relationships, transformed the way we think about gender. Though skeptics have claimed Beauvoir's ideas to be a simple reiteration of Sartre's, recent discoveries have revealed the ingenuity of her philosophy. After the release of these never-before-published diaries and letters, we wanted to sit down with Kate to talk about her new book and analyze Beauvoir from a different perspective. To quote Beauvoir, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Take a listen. I'm here today with Kate Kirkpatrick, the author of Becoming Beauvoir. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I just want to say, first of all, it was such a beautifully written book. It was so accessible. I really just enjoyed reading it a lot because I I grew up loving Simone de Beauvoir like a lot of girls. And she really took a a huge role in, in how I started thinking about my own feminism and my relationship to it. So it was just... I didn't really know that much about her life before this. I had only read bits and pieces of The Second Sex. I didn't really know anything about her her fiction. So it was it was really enjoyable to to learn different things about her life, especially the more the less savory aspects, shall we say? Yes, I'm glad you found it uh, so informative, but also enjoyable. That's super satisfying. So I just want to start with asking you a question about your personal background and and your philosophical background and what inspired you to write this book in the first place. So it's hard to pick like a single genesis moment for this book Mm -hmm. because in 2008, a friend of mine gave me a copy of The Mandarins, uh, one of Beauvoir's novels. And that was the first time I had read her fiction. I, like you, I'd read bits of The Second Sex, um, but that was, I'd say, when my interest in her was sort of kindled in a way that kept burning. And... So in 2010, I began my doctorate, which was on the philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre. And I did that because I have a background in both philosophy and theology, and I'm very interested in kind of metaphysical, metaphysical, but also metaphilosophical questions about what makes something philosophy as mm-hmm. opposed to theology or religion. So why might someone choose to write something in the form of a traditional philosophical essay as opposed to a novel? And this period in French philosophy, of which Sartre is part and of which Beauvoir is part, is great for asking those kinds of questions. Um, so I did my doctorate on Sartre, looking a lot at early influences on his philosophy before the period that he's famous for. So he's famous for being part of the French phenomenological movement and, and for existentialism. But before phenomenology entered France through the works of people like Husserl and Heidegger, there were French philosophers asking similar questions about method and the purpose of philosophy without using that label. Mm -hmm. And so my work on Sartre's early philosophy led me to think that actually perhaps some of the misapprehensions of his philosophy in the English-speaking world had also led to the reception of Beauvoir as his derivative counterpart. Mm. Absolutely. And reading some of the old media, the way that they used to describe Simone de Beauvoir, I mean, the New Yorker article where they call her the prettiest existentialist that you ever saw, it's just truly mind you know, mind blowing to me. But I mean, speaking of that, so clearly there have been biographies written about Simone before including her own memoirs. And there's already quite a record of her life. Why do you think it's relevant and important to write another biography about her life? So there are two answers to that. The short one is that there's new material available, Mm -hmm. which I think illuminates some of the kind of questions that people have been asking about her for a long time. And the long answer is that I think that Beauvoir has been despite her contributions to feminism and 20th century and 21st century intellectual life, um, I think that she has fallen foul of the Matilda effect, which is Mm -hmm. um, the the effect whereby women's accomplishments are attributed to the men in their lives. And you might not think that that's a defensible claim, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
not for a woman as famous as Simone de Beauvoir, but when you look at her life as she had to live it and the kinds of criticism that she had to face as a woman who was saying the things she was saying, she was accused of being unoriginal and narcissistic and vain. And even from 1949, you know, the year in which the second sex appeared, people were saying, feminism is so out of date. How can she be so uncool as to think this is relevant? And when I read much of what she's saying, I think it remains relevant. Uh, So that made me curious, really. And I kept digging and found more and more stuff that was interesting to me. Yeah, that's the thing is that when you read about how she was talked about in her life and also, you know, retrospectively, it's like she can't win either way. Either she's not feminist enough or she's white feminist you know, if you're talking about her through the lens of intersectional feminism now. Or during her time, she was vapid or narcissistic, as you say, or just a disciple of or proselytizer of Sartre and existentialism. Didn't have any original ideas of her own. It's, it's she's damned as she does, damned as she doesn't. So it's it just a never ending story for women intellectuals, right? <laughs> I, I, hope it, I hope it can end better than hers does. Um, but yes. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, okay, so there's 400 pages of truly rich details of this woman's life. And it was was just wild to read about some of these anecdotes. Do you have something that you learned about her that was just exciting or intriguing? Or what was your favorite fact that you learned about Simone? Oh, I feel like this is a very political question um, because if I like, there are many sort of worthy and admirable facts about her, and there are also frivolous and endearing facts about her. And it's hard to choose as a biographer. Um, you can go for both if you want. So I think her work ethic is astounding, and one of the things that I found very striking in the ways that she was described, not just by column images in newspapers and magazines, but mm-hmm. by the people in her life was that some people would describe her as very generous um, and encouraging. And she was uh, the mentor to many writers, although she didn't go around kind of bragging about how virtuous she was. And so I think there's, there's this incredible generosity, but also an incredible ability to have boundaries. So people were frustrated when she said, this time is my time and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to write now. And so there are a lot of people who wanted her time, you know, from from or quite early on in her life. And solitude was something she knew she had to protect. So I think that that was very interesting because I think narratives of selfishness and women not giving their time away continue to be much debated in contemporary culture. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and so to see how she could be described both as such a generous person with her encouragement of others, but also such a boundary one, I thought was really interesting. The other thing that I found striking in writing the book, but also in the reaction that I've had so far, is that a lot of people think that she, as a feminist, would reject a lot of things that are characteristically associated with femininity. Mm -hmm. So there's a mural in South America which depicts her holding Cosmo Mm -hmm. um, and says that she's she's holding it because the artist was trying to make a statement about Beauvoir rejecting the pursuits of beauty or make up more magazine reading. And I find this really quite surprising because she wrote for Vogue and Harper's and Flair and other magazines because she thought what she was saying needed to be read by people who read those things. If you read her fiction, it's there's lots of, well, attention to detail like textiles. And it's not because these things are feminine pursuits, it's because it's human to enjoy mm-hmm. beauty. So I think there are these, you know, that's, that's something I found quite striking in the, the ways that she's, presented as a feminist uh, that she must therefore reject these things it seems quite surprising that people would make that yeah assumption but anyway so people are reacting that way that it's 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 strange that she would write for cosmo or be holding up a cosmo because she's attending to these sort of superficial ideas of femininity well so this one there's this one mural which is mm-hmm. which which has that kind of artist statement alongside it uh, but other people have sort of appreciated the fact that I didn't write that part of her out of the book because it was there, you know. So it's just as much a part of her identity yeah. as anything else is. Yeah, yeah and, and you're totally right. I mean, like that is the material life of people's experiences. The people that she wanted to reach were not necessarily in the ivory tower. They were reading Vogue. That's that's interesting. I, I feel like when I was reading it, my my two favorite sort of fun anecdotes for both Beauvoir and Sartre are like a little bit 
more superficial than that. I loved reading. I loved when she was in New York with the riots and people offered her, you know, a joint and she ended up smoking six joints, did not get high, got so angry that she ended up chugging like half a bottle of whiskey, right? When I read that, I was just like, yeah, and with Sop, it was when I guess he was still in university and he took a water balloon and threw it out and said, thus pissed Zarathustra, which I thought was truly the geekiest yes. prank. Yes. <laughs> Very on-brand research, yes. I think the irreverence, his irreverence was very charming to lots of people around him. So, Well, speaking of the two of them, I mean, there's much to be said about their relationship. But one thing, one reoccurring thing that I encountered in your book is that so many of Beauvoir's personal relationships informed her philosophy, especially her concepts of freedom and ideas about love. Can you kind of expound upon that, particularly with regards to her parents, which, I mean, her early childhood was really like revelatory for me because I didn't know anything about it. This is something that's very important for the formation of her philosophy. She, her philosophy developed alongside, you know, the, the famous names of her contemporaries, so Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and others. It also was developed in dialogue with psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the central questions of existentialism is about how much we're free and how much we're determined by things like our past or our bodies, what existentialists call facticity. So all the features of your existence, like when you were born, where you were born, who your parents are. Um, I think Americans like to call this socioeconomic socioeconomic status. Yes. 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 Um, (laughs) So, We're getting there. <laughs> in existentialism, questions about freedom and determinism were central to the project of existentialism. And so Beauvoir wanted an account that gave the right amount of credit to the importance of the circumstances in which you grow up, because those she thought were central to the kind of person you become. And so her own childhood, I think, is is really important for understanding her life because she was born into a family. Uh, in 1908, in France, during a period of immense social change, her, her father was from the high bourgeoisie, and he was the second-born son, so he wasn't going to inherit the grandeur of the family estate, and he couldn't, partly as a result of his investments in the First World War, he couldn't offer his daughters dowries that would make them the right kind of marriage. So Beauvoir got a, a nearly unprecedented education for women in France. and. This, however, was not welcomed as like an accomplishment to be celebrated by her parents, at least not wholly, because it also seemed to indicate their failure socially. And so there's a lot in her childhood, which I think is fascinating. And although it did happen in, in this period from 1908 to 1929, when she passes the exam and starts to live independently very soon thereafter, a lot of the things that she faced are are faced in to a certain degree by women now. I mean, I think there's still a lot of women who think they're encouraged to be intelligent, but not too intelligent because you don't want to challenge men. This narrative is still operative in the kind of films we see in Hollywood and in people's lives. Yes. So I think there was the, the kind of the social context was really important, but also the relationships with her mother and on the subject of love, the relationship of her mother and her father to each other. Because she, her mother had this very self-sacrificial ideal of love. And Beauvoir's mother was Catholic and, you know, and and Catholicism, like other branches of Christianity and Judaism, one of the kind of important imperatives of being religious is that you love another as yourself. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, there are two commands that you love God and that you love the other as yourself. You see from the earliest written texts we have in the student diaries, this preoccupation in Beauvoir's works about what it means to achieve both, where you love yourself, but also the other, and neither too much nor too little. Right. And and you strike this kind of dichotomy between her two her mother and her father, I guess her father, it's easy to strike this dichotomy between them being that she's Catholic. She's, she loves that she's practicing the golden rule. Whereas her father is the scientific, emotionally removed one that is pursuing 
the life of the mind. And, and I think that observing their dynamic with, well, them, but also with her relationship with Zaza, I think really informed her ideas of femininity and the sort of constraints of womanhood, especially afforded to her at the time. Yes, absolutely. The kinds of behaviors that her father got away with, her mother never would have got away with. And, and I think, I wouldn't say that it's so much about that, that her, her father was characterized as like the reasonable one and her mother the faithful one. Because I think in the French cultural context, there is this kind of national pride and lazy tape, which is a certain kind of French secularism. And so I think there's all, she's also kind of drawing on the cultural resonances of traditional French Catholicism and this kind of secularity. And she says that growing up in that household is one of the reasons that she became an intellectual, I think, because she mm-hmm. saw this conflict, which is a conflict in French culture that spans centuries. <laughs> and so it's, there's, there's a nice kind of nod to her situatedness in French culture there too, I think, as well as to the disagreements between her parents. Mm. And what happened with Zaza also really struck me because, I mean, well, can you describe what happened? Yes. Her relationship? Yes, well, I don't want to give it away. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a really interesting, it's such an interesting story in Beauvoir's life. She had this incredibly important friendship as a child with Zaza. That was the nickname for uh, Elizabeth Lacroix. She found in Zaza someone with whom she could have intellectual conversations about philosophy. And I think a lot of her friends at school were from similar sort of bourgeois backgrounds, but Mm. they didn't have necessarily the same intellectual inclinations that Beauvoir did as a child, or at least she didn't didn't see them if they did exist. Mm. But with Zaza, she could talk about life and philosophy, and she, she started to see how different other girls' lives were. And in particular, Zaza's family was a traditional Catholic family, very wealthy enough to give each of their daughters about 250,000 franc dowries, which is an incredible amount of money at the time mm. in the 1920s. For Zaza, the two options for her future were still marriage or the convent. And if she chose marriage, it wasn't really a choice of her own because the whole the person that she married had to be vetted as, uh, as an appropriate sort of person to get this mm. 250,000 franc dowry and to bring the family the right amount of honor. So I think seeing the way that this life was scripted just on account of being, you know, a woman's life and how much suffering it cost her friend and the story is really tragic, I think was very, very formative for Beauvoir. But I don't want to even give it away because she had to wait actually until 1958 to find out the truth of the story. Um, Zaza died in 1929. And so for nearly 30 years, Beauvoir felt heartbroken and without resolution about why this friend um, had suffered like she did. And I feel like more than any of her relationships, or at least that was my my impression, was that that really formed what would become, you know, the ideas behind the second sex. There's this quote, I think it's from you. It's Nietzsche wrote, the task of each person is become who you are. But Beauvoir's philosophical rejoinder was, what if, as a woman, who you are is forbidden? What if becoming yourself simultaneously means being seen as a failure to be what you should be, a failure as a woman or as a lover or as a mother? What if becoming yourself makes you the target of ridicule, spite, or shame? And I think her childhood experiences with Zaza and her mother basically highlighted all of those contradictions of womanhood, that there's really no way to exist without being a target of ridicule. So I found that quite fascinating. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's, she, sometimes I think her voice was prophetic. I mean, clearly it spoke to women in her own time as well. But I, I think it continues to speak <laughs> in a relevant way to a lot of women now. In what ways do you find her prophetic? Well, so one of the, given my uh, wider intellectual interests, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in what's happened to values and uh, post Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead. And so there are various options that people took in the early, early 20th century. And one, one way of reading what Beauvoir is doing in the second sex is saying, look, this death of God has different values for women because Mm -hmm. love she actually says explicitly that love for women is a religion Mm -hmm. if you want your life to have a meaning or a justification in the way that it used to do when if you believe in the sort of religion that has salvation then uh, she thought that this this emphasis on uh, women sacrificing their lives or making themselves the perfect lovers 
being for men, she calls it. This is what's the, the kind of ideal of womanhood that's been held up to women. And I think when it's not universally the case that that's what happens now, but it happens enough to be problematic in my view. So, Yeah. There were so many points in this book that I felt like she was also prophetic. I mean, the, the quote that I was uh, telling you about earlier, there's this, when she's in the States traveling around, she observes the dynamic between American men and American women. And I just have to read it because I, I reacted so viscerally to it and everybody, well, I'll just say, she noticed, Beauvoir noticed an antagonism between men and women that they didn't like each other. She, Beauvoir explains that, quote, this is partly because American men tend to be laconic and in spite of everything, a minimum of conversation is necessary for friendship, but it's also because there is a mutual distrust. That truly went to the jugular. I read that to a few of my friends and they were just like, what? holy crap, I mean... That really, I think, describes the dynamic of most heterosexual relationships in this country still, Gosh. because it's, I know it's very depressing, but. Well, I mean, I didn't put in a lot of her criticism of American capitalism, but it is, it, it's, it's very interesting reading her comparisons of what she observes in American women's behavior and American feminism and the, the, the contrast that she draws between what's expected in France, uh, both in terms of behavior and feminism. And I think it's it's very important. The, the American-French contrast has got a lot of attention, and she did travel wild, uh, wildly, well, probably wildly is true, but also widely, <laughs> um, in other countries. And I think it's one of the reasons that she was, that she came to the conclusions that she did about femininity not being something universal. So she's mm-hmm. very critical of the idea that there's an essential an essence of woman or uh, a feminine essence, she calls it. And I think the cultural variability plays a large role in that. But the passages on relationships between American men and women are quite, well, incisive, shall we say. Very incisive, a little too incisive, considering that they were written like 60 years ago. But uh, I mean, you say that she strikes in her writings on America, she strikes a contrast between Feminism and femininity in both France and the U.S. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. So I think, so it's one of the things that she was very interested in 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 her time in the States was the the expectations uh, surrounding the acquisition of stuff Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the way that these plays played out in relationships between men and women, because it seemed that women were supposed to demonstrate, you know, wear the wealth and men were supposed to earn the wealth. Oh. And <laughs> that's so true. Yeah, no, that's true. And so I think she thought that this was oppressive for both men and women because mm-hmm. the, there was like the, the, the capitalism had, in, in the kind of way that she saw it in certain parts of America, definitely placed uh, a burden on men to be uh, the big earners and on women to be the people who demonstrated wore the wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's part of it. And I think... One of the things that I would say is that she is quite nuanced in in her passages on these subjects with saying that some women are happy to be homemakers and some women are not happy to be homemakers. And so she's she's very interested, though, when she goes around colleges because she did a lecture tour around the Northeast and she was constantly wanting to hear what people thought. Um, so she's asking young young women what they were thinking about for their futures. And some of them went to, you know, reputable universities as they saw it because it was the path to the right kind of marriage mm-hmm. uh, and so they hadn't really necessarily thought about what alternative futures could getting await an, them getting an mrs as they say yes, exactly <laughs> i don't know if they say that in the uk uh probably not so much but you know it, it translates it's not quite as uh, prolific as it once was of course yes. when all these sister colleges were the only options yes. for women but yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think as a, as a slice of that period of American history, it's interesting in itself for the kind, kinds of conversations she was having with people. Yeah, I mean, of course, I, I'm a native New Yorker, so it was actually really exciting. I don't know if you experienced this, but when somebody you really admire, when you're reading about them in your city and like, oh, she was in the West Village, you know, <laughs> just thinking about where she was in the yeah. time. That was really intriguing. But simultaneously, it's also brutal and necessary to have somebody from the outside holding up a mirror to your country and 
you know, I haven't read the American travel log that she wrote, but it's, as you write, considered to be one of the most incisive commentaries on racial and gender politics in 20th century America. So she also had these, this really incredible relationship with the rights, Richard and Ellen Wright. I mean, do you want to talk about that relationship? She, cause she like wrote so much about the racial dynamics in America. Yes. Yeah. So it's, this is a topic that has brought her some criticism and accusations of being a white feminist. So I think it's definitely worth talking about it because she, so I personally, I'm of the view that her writings show what we would now call intersectionality from from pretty early in the 1940s. So she wrote a play called Useless Mouths, which was set in medieval Flanders. So it was set within the constraints of what was historically possible in medieval Flanders. Mm -hmm. It showed attention to factors like age and poverty and as well as, uh, you know, sex and in questions about who has, whose who's needs matter, mm-hmm. whose needs are going to be prioritized by society. And when she came to the United States and spent time in New York, she was told, you know, not to go further north than a certain number block. And she had experiences of taxis passing her by if she was with the rights because it was two white women with a black man. And on the other hand, she was celebrated at parties by, you know, the elite of New York City. Mm-hmm. And she went and she, with Richard Wright, um, th- that friendship was really rich. And she trans- helped kind of play a role in his translation into French. And when, mm-hmm. he's, when she was with them in New York, he, he would uh, introduce her to people and take her to places, including places like the Abyssinian Baptist Church, where Adam Clayton Powell was preaching. And so she she heard the kind of the message of liberation coming from kind of North Manhattan. (laughs) And she kind of walked in her day to day experience. She went where people told her she wasn't safe walking because Mm -hmm. she wasn't content to just stay where the white people said she should stay. And so I think it's really interesting to put this in context as well, because the American travelogue, America Day by Day, is a 1947 book. And she had just been in Paris under the occupation, and so she comes to America, which is supposed to be the land of the free, and she says, the sad truth is that the general interest applies only to a private category of citizens, those who profit from the ruling elite and who intend to go on profiting. Mm. She gets here and she says, what Americans call freedom is the most abstract of freedoms, and she gives the example of a Jewish captain who wanted to go to a swimming pool in Baltimore, but he was recognized to be Jewish, and so he was barred. And she gives, this is a quote from a newspaper that she found at the time, which I think is really striking. She says, the newspaper concluded, in this story, we can admire the freedom the American citizen enjoys. The Jewish captain freely demanded admission to the pool, and they freely refused him. He freely wrote to the paper, which printed his letter and those of his supporters, as well as one that reflected a different attitude. In this way, everyone exercised his freedom. (laughs) So she she gets to New York, and she raises a point that I think people outside the U.S. still raise about American politics, which is that the democratic ideal in the United States sometimes seems like a cynically exploited, hypocritical lie. And there are a couple of pages in America Day by Day where she says it's not fair to say that it's a cynically exploited, hypocritical lie because the ideal is more than empty chatter. So she sees in a lot of American citizens this desire for freedom and equality Mm -hmm. um, and the respect for human beings and the desire for rights to be respected. And what she says is that the social conditions of Americans mean that they accept a kind of inequality that they shouldn't. So I'm going to read again just because I think it's really powerful and interesting. In daily life, human relations are established on an equal footing. Each person's pride in his title of American citizen creates an area of ready understanding. Each person can disguise the mediocrity of his fate by thinking he participates in the life of a great nation. And each Mm -hmm. person recognizes others as his fellow creatures and wants the dignity of man and of the American to be affirmed in his fellow creature. So she goes on to talk about this and the, the, the kinds of ideals. And she says that, The truth is that every day there's an increasingly radical divorce between the ideal and the reality. And she goes on to describe the everyday divorce that she sees in the streets of not just New York, but other parts of America as well. And I think there are sentences in there in what she goes on to say, which could have been written today. So, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if this is reassuring, but people of my generation definitely know the jig is up. I think that there's not as much, I don't think, I think people are definitely disenchanted with what they now see as the sort of mythology of American yes. equality. So yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting that, I don't know, maybe it took this guy in the White House to acknowledge that American freedom exists, but is only afforded to a certain class of people, a protected class of people. I think the, on the critical point, in the second sex, she did make a, an analogy between racism and sexism and that she's, she's attracted some criticism for doing that in the way that she did by Catherine Gines and others, uh, mm-hmm. other scholars working on Beauvoir. Um, so I think it's important to note that. But I think also she, she, she definitely got the problem right. <laughs> the, her analysis, I think, may have gone off well, down some paths that were not the right paths to go down. But she was, she was trying to solve the right kinds of problem, I think, for what it's worth. So you don't personally find her, the accusations of white feminism against Simone de Beauvoir, like, accurate or well i think it would depend on the text in question or the problem in question i mean i think that some of that reading of her as a white feminist i find kind of baffling because Mm -hmm. in you know she she actively campaigned for the decolonization of algeria she said that she was against all forms of oppression she's come under flack for the ways that some of the white women in her novels are depicted and the ways that black women in her novels are depicted i sometimes think that those criticisms can fail to take into account that she's describing white women who are in bad faith. Her characters are not always supposed to be ideals to emulate. Sometimes they're supposed to be people who provoke a reaction of dislike, so or the kind of reaction that makes you think, whoever I'm going to become, I don't want to become like that. <laughs> it's too complicated a question, given how much she wrote and how much she did to, to kind of give a single answer. But I think it's, given her situation in history, I think she was doing a lot of really good things uh, mm. to, to generate the kinds of conversation that we can have now about intersectionality. Yes, for what that's worth. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, personally, reading excerpts from her own work, it really felt like she was fully aware of how social conditions could completely render people's experiences totally separate from one another. It could really determine people's access to freedom or their ideas of womanhood or whatever. There are inklings of intersectionality that I notice in her writings that I agree with you. I don't know if it's always fair to um, reflect back on her work and call it white feminism, especially because of the work that she did decolonizing Algeria or working towards the cause of decolonizing Algeria, which sort of brings me to my next question, which is, you know, something I also found very unique about her philosophy is that it was very applied. It was very, she wanted philosophy to be lived as opposed to this life of the higher mind only accessible to an elite class of people. She wanted it to affect the material lives of of regular people. And so she applied her philosophy to all these political movements, like various feminist movements in France and the US and all over the world, and also towards, you know, participating in the Algerian resistance. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yeah. So I think that Beauvoir was absolutely from uh, from her late teenage years on committed to the idea that she didn't want to just think or just live she wanted to think life mm-hmm. and so this kind of tradition and philosophy some people associate with more with ancient philosophy so there's a famous book by Pierre Hadot called philosophy as a way of life mm-hmm. uh, that looks at ancient philosophers and I think you get other exceptions recently who want philosophy to be something that informs their life it's one of the reasons that it's so interesting as a philosopher to approach Beauvoir's life biographically, because integrity for her was an ideal. She wanted her thoughts and her life to agree with each other. Mm. <laughs> and at different points in her life, she recognized that she didn't really uh, agree with her behavior or that her thoughts needed to be changed. So I think that's it's really interesting and frankly inspiring to, because sometimes people think that mind changing means you're a hypocrite, but actually if you find the way you've been living is wrong, it seems to me perfectly reasonable to reject that way and adopt a new one. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I think her philosophy is, 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 is very much formed by her historical context. I think her national context in France and the kinds of intellectual debates taking place in France at the time it's, it's just really rich to look at the philosophy in the context mm-hmm. of, of how she's living. 
Yeah, like tangible things as if she actually, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, but she did inspire legislation to increase access to abortion in France, yes. correct? Yes, so she was one of yeah. the signatories of a famous, the manifesto of the 343. And by that time, she was such a prominent cultural figure in France, this is the early 1960s, that she, yeah, she played a large role in the consciousness raising and the change in public opinion. So there was one very influential trial about surrounding access to abortion. And she, in addition to signing that manifesto, played a role in getting that trial press coverage and mm-hmm. uh, and writing about it herself so that people would, uh, would see that this was an, an opinion that might be worth revising. Mm. Writing a biography is obviously really daunting considering the the stature of this person. I mean, this colossal figure in French intellectual history, especially with sort of, you know, less savory aspects of her life, if you will, or, I mean, and just speaking for this person who has had such a stronghold in, you know, intellectual and creative imagination. Was it, I mean, what was, what was that experience like? What was your process trying to articulate her experience without feeling like you were speaking for her? So, frankly, it was quite terrifying. Um, I, I think I used the word terrifying in the introduction <laughs> because the it, it is a person's life. And if you read people writing about biographers, they sometimes use really quite ugly metaphors for what they're doing. You get called a gossip monger or a voyeur. Those are on the negative end of the, the spectrum. I think there's another approach that I find much more appealing, which is that biography is... A simple act of complex friendship. (laughs) I I wouldn't claim to have a friendship with Simone de Beauvoir because generally I think one needs to know people in real life to be friends with them. But the process had a lot of stages. I mean, it started off with the suspicions that I mentioned at the beginning that that she her life had been read in a certain way where her relationships, especially her scandalous relationships, had been prioritized over her own thoughts and Mm -hmm. achievements. As I continued to read and as I read the receptions of her work in France and the kinds of things that people were saying about her, I developed more of a thesis, which was that her life, this is no news, is highly politicized. But the way that it's politicized seems to fall into this pattern that I've called in the book an ad feminum strategy, where if she can be reduced, if she can be reduced to a failure as a thinker because all of her thoughts are derivative of Sartre's, or a failure as a woman because she fails up, fails to live up to like traditional feminine ideals, or just a failure as a human being because she fails to, to, to conform to the moral ideals of the people who judge her, but then a lot of people's reaction is just to say she's irrelevant or uninteresting instead of to find out what she actually thought. I decided to take the approach of trying to focus on the way the thought and the life shaped each other, in particular because her her controversial behavior in the 1930s with young women uh, happened before she went on to write her ethics and before she went on to write The Second Sex and before she became an activist and writer of autobiography and, you know, a campaigner who, mm-hmm. who decided that actually were writing even literary texts that were supposed to affect people at the level of the imagination wasn't enough. What was needed was legislative change so that the concrete possibilities for women's lives would be different. And I think showing that transformation in her was something that I wasn't satisfied that other bio- other biographies had done. Mm-hmm. Um, and for reasons that I go into in the book, she also omitted certain details in the story that she told about her life in her autobiography. And it's very interesting to ask the question why she did that and how people reacted to that mm-hmm. uh, because it went on to shape her writing thereafter. Yeah, and and how she's actually written about in the historical narrative. Yeah. In the introduction, you do get to this idea where you wanted to resist the idea of writing a biography that was too reductivist. Yeah. You say that you didn't want, bios have the potential to read into a person's life rather than letting the life speak for itself. and. Obviously, especially looking back on her life, we can we can see clearly the way that sexism shaped her career, shaped her relationships. But you make a point of saying that you didn't want a feminist framework to 
completely cloud over her individuality, where you didn't want sexism to play too much of a role in the way that you depicted her life. I think sexism did play a role in the in some, some of the kinds of reviews that she got. And in particular in the 1940s, it's really interesting that she writes this essay on existentialist ethics in 1943, and it's published in 1944. And yet the philosophers in Europe, are they wait until Sartre publishes ethical text later in the 1940s, or even until her essay, The Ethics of Ambiguity, comes out, which is in the later 1940s, to say, oh, here we have the ethics of existentialism. And historically, that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's sort of written out, even quite quickly, she's written out of the narratives of existentialism, which is one of the most famous 20th century philosophical movements. (laughs) So so this seems to me... I don't know what good reasons there are for this. If I don't think there are good reasons, I'll just say I don't know that there are good reasons. Maybe they exist and I just don't know them. In the case of sexism and and her life later on, I mean, feminism by the 60s and 70s had come to mean so many different things that feminists would accuse each other of sexism just for not being the kind of feminists that they were. So this is part of the reason why I wanted to avoid taking too doctrinaire a position, because Beauvoir's own political commitments as a feminist, when she did things like edit Everyday Sexism, which is a column in Les Temps Modernes, was to give a voice to different perspectives, because it's normal for human beings to disagree with each other about what it means to flourish. And so it's not really surprising that feminists should disagree about what's going to help women flourish. And mm-hmm. her, her, her view in that, in that particular period, at least, was that she was going to publish a range of perspectives. Well, clearly sexism played a role in the way that Sartre and Beauvoir are respectively remembered. Yes. I think when you read their obituaries, of course, in Sartre's obituaries, I think it was just the New York Times or maybe a few that acknowledged her, yeah. let, you know, let alone said something that was accurately portraying yes. the importance of their relationship. She was, if she was talked about, she was talked about as a, a mistress, essentially. Yes. Whereas in her obituary, of course, he he played <laughs> the the leading yeah. role. Um, what's interesting as well is it's not quite. I think the point that you try and make in your book is that it's not quite clear cut who inspired who, but that it was actually a very symbiotic relationship. It made me think how intellectual property in France, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I feel like it is really different than it is here because there were many times where such did, he didn't acknowledge her or cite her in his texts, but she also didn't always cite Kant when she you know, was invoking his ideas in her work. And even though that's actually beautiful, this idea of like not actually having ownership over ideas, I do think it contributed in some way to the confusion over her her role in the development of existentialism. Yes, I think that's probably true, but I think it's also there's an element of being lost in translation here. There are some some passages in Beauvoir's text, even the second sex. Another good example is the introduction to the first couple of paragraphs to the Ethics of Ambiguity, where she uses phrases that would immediately invoke a particular philosopher in the mind of a French reader who was educated in French philosophy. So in the beginning of the Ethics of Ambiguity, um, she talks about the thinking read. Now, the thinking read is famously associated with Pascal's Mm pensée. In the beginning of the Ethics of Ambiguity, uses the phrase thinking read because she knows that her French readers will recognize that as an allusion to Pascal. And in The Second Sex as well, there are many passages where she'll take sentences and change one or two famous sentences from literature or philosophy and change one or two words in a very witty way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes she's, uh, sometimes she's just being sarcastic. And I think her translators and readers in English have sometimes assumed that this was internalized misogyny, some of these passages, that she, she was taking these kinds of negative descriptions of women too seriously, when in fact she's subverting them through her use of language. And so I think there are a lot of cultural reasons as well as sexism that I think could play into the the way she's been received in the English-speaking world. But certainly I think sexism is significant. I mean, I think I'd also like to add that in terms of translation, sometimes it's not just 
picking up on the subtleties of sarcasm in another language. Sometimes, at least in the older translations of things like The Second Sex or even America Day by Day, the English translations would, at least the American translations, would blatantly take out the more politicized bits about criticizing the sort of criticizing the racism in this country, for yes. instance. Yes, I mean, this is one of the things that, that is unfortunate. You know, it's, it, she can look less critical of racism if your edition of America Day by Day does not include the parts where she calls out American hypocrisy about race. So yes, mm. this also, I think, has played into her, the, her kind of legacy in the English-speaking mm-hmm. world. More on the act of, of writing and how people would borrow ideas within the French writing tradition, what I also found very interesting about Simone's work is that a lot of her works were combining fiction with philosophy with memoir. And I thought it was really intriguing that she would transcend genre that way, because to me, I think the way the attitude here would be that you're lacking imagination if you just write from your life so much. But I think what's so interesting is this idea of writing about your life, but using elements of fiction to drive the narrative. And in that writing about an actual truth, you excavate a deeper truth in a way that seems more productive than just recording it or documenting it. And I'm wondering if you think that that one is something that Beauvoir considered, or this idea of autofiction is something that she's considering when she was writing. And do you think it's a productive way to practice philosophy for yourself? I'm not tempted by it for myself, but I think Mm -hmm. that the the closest indication that we have of a kind of statement, a thesis statement about what she's doing methodologically in her autobiographies is from a a notice that was published in the 1958 edition of The Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter. And she says that she wants to write the theory of the second sex in a narrative form, avoiding the jargon of philosophy and psychoanalysis, and to to write the story of her own life. So she knew and she said in in, um, her letters to Claude Lanzmann when she was starting to write some of the passages that became Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter that she knew that her story with this, people found her interesting and that people found also her relationship with Sartre interesting. Personally, I situate this turn to life writing with her criticisms in 1955 and the essays that are published under the title Privileges where she criticizes intellectuals, especially leftist intellectuals, for claiming to care about the people, but not writing for them in liberating ways, like mm-hmm. writing for them in ways that only other intellectuals will read. So she writes that essay in the 50s, and then there are debates in the scholarship about whether there are kind of turning points in her experience that lead her to write the autobiography. It's actually something that she had been talking about for a long time, mm-hmm. inspired by uh, Michel Larisse's book, Manhood, and also, well, The Second Sex was inspired probably by that, but I think, you know, you can, the same book can inspire different things. <laughs> and this question of autofiction, there are a couple of Beauvoirians who've uh, written on this. So Karen Vinkus says that she doesn't think what Beauvoir is writing is autofiction, and that there, it might be politically problematic to classify her as someone who's writing out of fiction. Mm. And she described, she, she says this partly because Nelson Algren, when he was angry at Beauvoir after their, bro- their breakup, accused her of writing fiction, not autobiography. He was brutal. <laughs> he was brutal. Uh, yes, literary breakup vengeance is, is scary. Um, <laughs> so the there's a kind of there's one reading which says it's problematic to classify her as uh, writing out of fiction. And Strasse, who's a French writer working on Beauvoir, thinks that you, you know, just playing with genre is a question that's worth asking in Beauvoir's works. And the, the whole debate kind of goes back to the 70s, because in, in the 70s, two really significant works were published on the question of uh, what, what is happening when someone mm-hmm. claims to be writing autobiography? So uh, Philippe Lejeune wrote a, pact, a, a book called The Autobiographical Pact, where he says, if you are writing something that claims to be autobiography, then the author and the character are all the same person, and you're making a pact with the reader that this will mm-hmm. remain the same. And Beauvoir, she says she, that's not what she's doing in this 1958 text. And so I think it's interesting to read her this way, 
And there are some fruitful readings already in the kind of academic literature about this question. A question that I have about this is why would we place her in the, the category of writing out of fiction as opposed to the category of writing philosophical autobiography? Because when someone like Rousseau writes the confessions, uh, it uses the first person, it talks about mm-hmm. experiences, and it's still considered a philosophical form. And the same is true with Augustine's confessions, which arguably starts this uh, this kind of form of writing. So I'm, I'm interested in whether sexism might play a role in the way we classify Beauvoir's writings now. I, I think so. I mean, even the idea that she would be preoccupied with love as a philosophical issue yeah. is not new obviously, yeah. but it was treated as a sort of sub-philosophical idea when, when she was treating it. Yeah. The love command, as it's called, is something that appears in the great works of ethics, you know, so Kant's ethics includes this, this idea that you should love the neighbor as yourself. And you might say he's just kind of tipping his hat to the Christian tradition. Uh, John Stuart Mills does the same thing, but when they do it, it's not considered sub-philosophical. So why is it when she does? It's also not considered uninspired or unoriginal. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, one wonders, right? It's interesting, I think, also because it seemed as if she would also write these semi-autobiographical texts to put a a depth to certain relationship dynamics, right, with Olga or with some of the, the women in her life that she had these sort of you know, controversial relationships with, if you will. It seems like she tried to navigate the personal relationships in her life through this text. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's one place where she says outright that that's what she's doing, which is with the novel, she came to stay. Mm-hmm. And there's a kind of writing fiction as catharsis element, at least in some of the things she wrote about that novel. But I don't think... I would think there's answer also puts it really well that you you can't um, confuse the I who writes with the I that lived. Mm. Um, I think this like, and this is one of the reasons that I think it's still fruitful approach of life biographically because you can raise questions in a different way when you look at the text and say, well, how does the form of this writing affect what she what we should take away from it as true mm. of and Beauvoir? You know, we've talked a little bit about intersectional feminism and the ways in which her writing is still so incisive today. In fact, you know, I mentioned to you that I really encountered the inklings of queer theory and Judith Butler's philosophy, even with, you know, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. So where do you feel her place is in the conversations around feminism and racism today? I think this is a question that I'm asked frequently. And I think that it would be presumptuous to claim to know. I think the situation of women now has changed pretty dramatically uh, since 1986 in certain respects uh, and not in others. And and those changes depend on where you are in the world. And Beauvoir's philosophy emphasized very heavily the importance of uh, the situation for women, but also for particular women. You know, the second sex never uses the word gender. And one of the things that divides a lot of Francophone readers of the second sex from Anglophone readers is that Butler's reading has really been really influential in the English speaking world. And many Francophone readers read Beauvoir saying things like, it is bad faith for a woman to claim to be situated beyond her sex, or that the biological givens of a woman's body are an essential element of her situation. And they think that they place Beauvoir on a certain side of uh, contemporary debates um, mm-hmm. which is often not the side that Americans place around, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I suppose when I read a philosopher like, uh, you know, I'll just go with Plato, uh, I don't expect him to get everything right. Like, we don't, re- we don't read classic philosophical texts of the past because we think they nailed the problem or the mm-hmm. answer, but, but that they help us think about the problem in generative ways. And so I read the second sex and much of Beauvoir's other work as helping us think about some of the problems of feminism in really generative ways. But I would not claim with any authority to know where she would sit now. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kate Kirkpatrick, with Becoming Beauvoir. You can buy it now. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm Yeah, me too.